All right, this episode is the one you're going to be able to point to to settle a lot of old debates. Should you open valves all the way up or the quarter turn back? Do you have to shake or roll tanks? Are titanium regulators flammable if you're using nitrox? I mean, I own one. What makes a valid VIP sticker on a tank? And a few other things that actually blew my mind in real time there. Mark Grisham is the authority on cylinders and filling them and all that good stuff. Department of Defense, NASA, consult him. He's the owner of PSI PCI, the course that myself and most dive professionals take. He's literally one of the people that wrote the book on this stuff. There he is right there. Bumped into him at DEMA. If you're a gear techie, a technician, you operate a fill station, do inspections, or you just love this stuff and you want to geek out, welcome to heaven. Hi, right, cool. First of all, Mark, yeah. thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Appreciate and the opportunity. Are you kidding me? The opportunity is all mine. You've done consulting from everybody all the way up to NASA. I mean, you're rattling off numbers. You know this stuff. You see these tanks blowing up. You see all this craziness. You're in my opinion, where the buck stops. I'm not trying to blow any sunshine, but that's why we're here. Yeah. You said a lot of things that I've just, I mean, you see the pictures, you see the tanks exploding. Right. We in the diving business, we prepare a cylinder, a guy takes it out. We have no idea whether it has safe sex or not. <laughs> cylinder comes back and we're supposed to put pure O2 in it. So if we clean everything, we're starting out on a level playing field and we're all very cautious and we're very safe. Yes, contamination does occur, but it's in a controlled environment. A friend of mine was just talking and he said the one thing that gets him is there's still people that roll their tanks. What's the deal with the rolling tanks? Is that a real thing? For mixing the gases? If you partial pressure, partial pressure blend a cylinder, put a gauge on it, an analyzation gauge. Don't do anything to it, just fill it and look at the gauge. Then take a hammer and tap the sidewall and the ultrasonic wave will actually mix the gas and you'll watch the richness climb. No joke. What about rolling it? Rolling it, it's one way of mixing it, but it's not as effective. <laughs> so that's so, the real answer is you probably don't need to. You don't need to, no. I'm a prankster. I had a <laughs> cylinder sticker that said shake well before use and after nitrox filling and I actually had people shaking my cylinder while I stood over there and laughed. <laughs> okay, so for the record straight, you don't have to no, roll them and shake them. No, sir. <laughs> and you still see this being done? Yes, sir, absolutely. Why do I cut the end off the roast? Well, before I cook a pork roast, I cut both ends off because my mom did, because my grandmother did. My grandmother's pan was simply too short. That's how we do it here without thinking. I feel like the dive industry is particularly prone to the old habits. Yes. Why do you suppose that is? Oh, well, theory. No human, diver or not, likes change. And we're resistant to change. That's how we do it, it's how we're comfortable, we're not gonna change. An example, when Bill High started our company in 1983 at the old HQ in Seattle, where Bill started our program, at that time, every cylinder was filled in water. The theory was the water would cool the cylinder and cool the gas so we'd get a nice fill. When in fact, Amundsen's law, thermodynamics equations say that's nonsense, because it is. Lumped heat <laughs> transfer doesn't cool the gas very fast. And it took Bill starting to say that in 1983 until about 10 years ago for people to stop using water tanks. It's a slow evolutionary change. So there's no benefit to filling a tank in water? Nope, unless you leave it soak in the water for a long period. About an hour, 49 minutes to cool the gas in an aluminum cylinder to the water temperature, about 50 minutes to cool a steel cylinder to the water temperature. That's cooling the gas thoroughly. So the average fills around eight to 10 minutes. So what do you accomplish? You increase the likelihood of getting the valve wet, the fill whip wet, and putting the water inside the cylinder, which we definitely don't want. What is the most dangerous part of scuba diving? Filling cylinders. More than drowning? Yeah, it's, it's a dangerous place. And, and I, I wish I could show you right now. I have in my pocket my phone. I was contacted by one of the manufacturer's attorneys just a few hours ago to show me a cylinder, a medical oxygen cylinder that blew up and killed a guy this morning. It's a negative that continues to happen because we're not paying attention, we're not trained, and we're filling too fast. What's one thing at the average diver out there, maybe they don't fit their own tanks or whatever, what could they do to make sure they aren't sitting there with one that blows up? This is a question that's often asked. and was asked earlier today. Firefighters were standing here. We don't worry about our cylinders. We send them to a guy. Is that guy trained? How do you know that guy has met the standard? Your life support system is done, filled, tested, inspected by some guy, and you don't know his credentials. Well, I'm not gonna assume he knows anything until I verify he knows something. Average Joe diver, I walk into a dive center. I assume they're trained, when in fact that's not true usually. You wanna know that your inspector, your hydro tester are formally trained to meet the requirements of the federal government. 
You were saying something in the class too that the PSI PCI stickers or the BIP stickers, they said something on them and that most dive shops actually don't have the right labeling. What is the biggest offender out there? We don't call ours VIP stickers because VIP is copywritten by SSI. We call them evidence of inspection sticker. <laughs> Dive stickers or inspection stickers are notorious for making promises. You can't promise an inspection that's valid for a year. We accept a year, but if I take that cylinder that's standing right there, I just inspected it, but I knock it off the tailgate of my pickup. Is it due an inspection? So the inspection's good for the time it takes to do the inspection. You can't guarantee tomorrow. The other thing people put on stickers <laughs> is all kinds of misinformation because they're trying to be cheap and only have one sticker versus a nitrox sticker and an air sticker and so forth and so on. So this cylinder was O2 clean and it was done in accordance with standards of the scuba industry. There's no such thing. When you perjure yourself in public with a sticker, it makes your lawyer impossible to defend you in an accident. Oh my gosh, yeah. that's a juicy one. You said divers are two things. Cheap and creative. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. You don't have to look any further than these dive flag balls. That's correct. <laughs> you have to have heard a particular doozy. Oh, I've heard doozies. The fraudulent hydros that have occurred since COVID are very numerous. So much so the USDOT is investigating something almost nonstop. People that have garage hydros where they're snapping cylinders. And I say to those people, if a $45 hydro and a visual and a fill is too expensive, probably should go play with marbles or kites and leave this diving stuff alone. You would not believe this, but if you look behind me, there's a company that makes stickers over here and they sell stickers to anyone that says this cylinder meets PSI standards whether they're trained or not. So there's a lot of people that are profiteer in our industry and don't follow the rules and actually put themselves in legal jeopardy. Every lawsuit that I've worked on, eight now, working on my ninth, stickers have played a role in the lawsuit. What's something you see in the dive industry as a whole today, commonly held belief that you just passionately disagree with? How oxygen is filled and used and mixed because there's so much misinformation that gets passed around and people accept that because after all, he's a, a diver of, of great stature and that's the way he does it. What people need to realize is you haven't had an accident yet, yet is the operative word. Really frustrates me because when I teach classes, I hear all of the same questions asked over and over and over again. Well, if, 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 well, you know, the thing about if, if a frog had a glass acid, it would only jump once, if. <laughs> You said something in the class where anything over 23 and a half percent that's then considered like a, a nitrox blend or, or what's the terminology? It's division 2.2 class one oxidizing gas. 23.5% up to 100% is considered the same gas. So nitrox, and it's kind of interesting, if you go to the compressed handbook of gases, the word nitrox is not there. It's enriched air or oxygen, same category, same thing. It's actually more dangerous than oxygen because air oxygen mix is flammable, whereas Puro 2 is not flammable. You said something too, so anything over 23.5% mm -hmm. shouldn't be in titanium. So no. like a titanium regulator. No. Raw titanium, non-oxidized titanium, has a nasty habit in an O2 environment of spontaneously igniting. It's training that I received from Dr. Durkin. Dr. Durkin's a preeminent engineer. And when I said to Dr. Durkin, I said, how, what is the mechanism? And he says, we're not actually sure. So if Dr. Durkin is worried or not sure, I'm gonna be really worried. That's all there is to it. That's pretty straightforward. According to that rule of titanium regulator, shouldn't be using oxygen, anything over 23 and a half percent. Right. And the manufacturers all say they're valid up to 40%. 40. And again, there's a lot of argument there because there's a large gray area. The 40% threshold is directly a result and applicable to the commercial diving industry. <laughs> Title 29, 1910-401, that's your commercial diving rules, where you're allowed to do 40% threshold non-cleaning because you're getting pre-blended, pre-mixed racks of cylinders <coughs> plugged into your diving system. Whereas we scuba divers mix in our cylinders. And there's the big disparity. The many methodologies of how they're mixed, that's the scary part. People say, well, I don't have to clean until 40%, but then they parse the pressure blend and put 100% O2 in there. Goes in so right. how does that work? So if you only clean to a 40% threshold and putting 100% gas in there, haven't you sort of, should I say, disparaged yourself or not followed your own standards? So that's the fly in the ointment. A big one that's really stirred the pot in the dive industry lately. <laughs> the Dan article that came out a couple years ago saying it's okay to just go ahead and open up the valve gently mm -hmm. all the way open. And why are 
people still thinking they have to do the quarter turn back? Well, back in, let's say, the mid-60s, it was common to open valves all the way open and be careful because they could jam open. They had very th fine threads. As today, we have very coarse threads on the stem. So when, in fact, today, in about two full revolutions, almost all valves produced today are wide open. The quarter turn back was to prevent it from sticking open, which I don't understand why that's a big deal, because if your valve's open, you can still get gas. You have a gauge, you know, when to surface at 500 PSI or whatever you've designated. The other one is that we hear that if your valve's only open partially, you can breathe it closed. Recently, in the last year, doing tests for a certain space agency, we tried to make valves breathe closed. And at 19,000 PSI, 20,000 cubic feet a minute, you cannot close a scuba valve. You can't breathe them closed. No human is capable of that amount of volume. When did the valves change from the fine to the coarse? Threads? Evolutionary, and I would say probably, so the first Sherwood K valves were in 83, 84. <coughs> And that's when they started changing over to about two full, two and a half re revolutions opens a valve fully. So I've had many arguments about this on dive boats because I cannot stand it when the dive master opens my valve and it's not open all the way and you can't dive with us and so forth and so on. Usually I don't argue with them, but that night I say, you need to join me in the bar so we can have a valve discussion. We take apart a <laughs> valve and we have a great spirited discussion with beverage in hand and learn about valves. So it's a lot of fun. I enjoy it very much. Oh, oh, that's right. Everyone was asking me just today. You could answer this. I said, Are you uh, sure? I, I, if you can't answer it, nobody can. <laughs> when a tank is filled, cylinder, cylinder. Uh, if it's, I have to use proper terminology when I'm talking to Mark. <laughs> when it's filled, how long can it sit, you know, in your closet or garage or whatever? Does air ever go bad? Yes, in fact, it does. This debate started in the 60s again. The National Fire Protection Association, NFPA, in that time, it was a publication called Breathing Air. Today, it's NFPA 1981-2002 is a publication. And it says that cylinders that are filled shall not be left unused for greater than a year. The rule existed because one year in 1966 was a steel cylinder. If you have corrosion in the steel cylinder, you can reduce the fraction of oxygen down to as low as 3%, based on the University of Rhode Island experiment in 1960. Russ eats it? Yes. When you have corrosion, you have to have oxygen, something that corrodes, and of course, some moisture. And as it's growing rust, it's consuming oxygen. So that was the reason for that in the beginning. Nowadays, it's not that bad because we just don't see a lot of really crusty cylinders. NFPA still follows the one year rule. Now, here's the thing that I would advise anybody. If you're a diver, an avid diver today, you should have a gas analyzing gauge. It saved my life twice. A guy plunks down the cylinder, says, here's a cylinder for you to dive. We're diving to 144 feet seawater. And the cylinder was 44% oxygen. No labels on the cylinder, Ooh. no gas, so forth and so on. So doing my little analyzation of the gas prior to diving saved my life. What I'm saying to you is, if you leave it for a year, so what? How about you analyze it and determine if the FO2 is perfect for your fraction of oxygen and is good for your dive. And that way you can verify it. Simple as that. I can buy a cylinder at a yard sale from 1967 that's full of 2250 PSI, and it's out of hydro, out of visual. Am I allowed to use the cylinder? And the answer is yes. I may use the cylinder for its intended service or purpose until I reduce the gas pressure, then it must be requalified forthwith. Now, based on what I just told you, does that make any sense? Probably not. The University of Rhode Island experiment that was done in 1969 proved that a steel cylinder can corrode to condemnation limits in 100 days and only have 3% O2 left in it. Wow. 1974, this was repeated, and in 1974 with aluminum cylinders, and a grossly corroded aluminum cylinder can corrode to condemnation limits in as short as 240 days, but it will only consume about 3% of the O2, thus more corrosion resistant and still would sustain life. You need to be 19.5% or greater. Well, that finally clears that up. Cool. And you don't I have know, to shake it or roll it. I, you don't have to <laughs> shake it or roll it. And I, I'll guarantee you, I'll guarantee you people have all kinds of opinions on this, but I'm basing it off of facts. I go to manufacturers training. I talk to manufacturers. I'm seeking out education all the time, nonstop, year round. I'm always finding something to get trained on specific to this industry. So it's a lot of fun. Well, as a wise old one coming up on 80 years old, still teaching, told me, you stop learning, you die. Stop learning, you die. All right, last one. I mean, you know your stuff. Do you still enjoy scuba diving? Love scuba diving. I've been diving for 45 years, and I can't wait to go on my next dive trip. Um, my first dive was in literally a pond. 
buddy breathing off a modified O2 cylinder that my dad put together and we buddy breathed across the pond and back at six years old and I was hooked. What is it about diving? Is there a specific thing or is it a... When you think of diving, what's the little thing that you picture that's fun? Exploration. Seeing Sometimes you get to some, go someplace where no human has been. I recently was in Belize and I got to dive where we know no humans have been. The earth is so beautiful, there's so much to see that you can still go to places where humans don't go because it's remote, it's hard to get to, and it costs money. It still excites me. I'm, I'm still grateful for every time I get to dive. Mark, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate you. Hey, Thank appreciate you. you. If anything in that yeah. blew your mind, please leave it in the comments. I know my mind was blown more than once or twice during real time in that episode. And same with the person behind the camera. We had a long conversation after that. This one was juicy. Thank you all for being on here. Please subscribe to this channel. Have a great morning, afternoon, or evening. I'll see you on the next one.